Okay. So the format for today will be, I'm going to be doing a short interview with Mr. Dorsey before we then open it up to questions from the floor. So my first question is one that I asked you just 10 minutes ago before I realized I don't want you to answer. What is the best thing about your job? Um, probably the best thing about my job is just being able to see, like, the, the feeling you get when you, uh, when you help create something and you actually see people interact with it and you see people use it, um, whether it be, you know, in, in my case, a, a program or a piece of hardware or uh, art, when you actually see it on someone else's face and you, and you see that interaction, it's just, uh, it feels electric. So being able to, to see people use our technologies and, and to see our customers um, has been really stunning. My, my favorite is always when my, my mom independently discovers something that I didn't have to tell her about. And, uh, and uh, there are two moments when the first thing is my parents were some of the first people on Twitter and we started with SMS. And my mom thought it was the, uh, it was the way to contact me and my family. Like she thought Twitter was SMS and she thought it was a private channel. <laughs> so she would, and you can now search back to all of her uh, first tweets and it's at Marcia Dorsey. Um, you can search back to all of her first tweets and uh, she was actually like yelling at my brothers and <laughs> Jack, when are you coming home and all these other things. And then she realized, oh, wait a minute, this is public. <laughs> And then the second time with, uh, with Square is she, um, her favorite coffee store in St. Louis, Missouri, Sump Coffee, um, started using us and she, she went in and she, uh, she texted me. She's like, Jack, uh, you know, um, my favorite coffee store just started using Square. And like, I, I love when people just happen upon it rather than having to direct someone, hey, go look at what I made, go look at what I did. Uh, especially, you know, someone, someone like my mom. So it's always, uh, that's probably the best part of the day is seeing how people seeing how people use it. Okay, and with regards to kind of your early career, I read somewhere that one of the main inspirations for Twitter was um, taxi systems and how they have very short, you know, messages to convey where they are. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. I really missed the boat on creating Uber, but I, I was <laughs> huge, uh, huge into dispatch, um, and the reason why is that. An, Pointing again back to my parents. My parents, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. St. Louis, Missouri. How many of you have been there? St. Louis. So St. Louis uh, has, a, has, had a, has had a tough history. And so in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, a lot of people left the city and moved out to the suburbs. And my parents always stood by the city. Uh, and the metropolitan area is about 4 million people. And the city has dwindled down to about 350,000 people. Um, and uh, it's extremely segregated, uh, north and south lines. Uh, it's highest, uh, highest homicide per capita in the country. We switch with uh, Detroit and um, DC, uh, those, those three usually. But my parents, uh, they grew up in the city, they love the city, and, and you know, for me it developed this obsession and fascination with cities as well. And the way that really manifested for me were maps, um, I was just obsessed with, with maps and I, I would get lost in them constantly, just wondering what was happening at this particular intersection or uh, what was you know, down the street, whatnot. And I had tons of maps of St. Louis and tons of maps of my other favorite city that I had never been to, which is New York City. My parents also had um, a uh, police scanner, always in a CB radio. So we lived right next to the highway and uh, I would always listen to the, the trucks and the, and, the, and the police and the fire trucks and the ambulances. And uh, eventually my parents uh, got a IBM PC Junior and a Macintosh. And I would actually take the information from the police scanner and <coughs> plot it out on, on my paper map so I could actually watch the police cars move because they're always reporting where they are and where they're going, and what they're doing. Um, but little by little, the computer became this thing that was, uh, was amazing because I could actually build a map on it. Uh, and I can make those, uh, I could put dots on that map and I can make those dots move. And I taught myself just enough programming to make that happen. And, and that's always been my approach in my life is I've never really uh, 
had a desire to become an engineer. I never had a desire to become a CEO or start a company or be an entrepreneur. I learned whatever it took to move me to the next step to unblock whatever I wanted to do. And for me, I wanted to see the city in a new way, and the computer was, was the way to get there. So I taught myself how to program in C, and uh, eventually I had these maps of police cars and ambulances that were um, riding around St. Louis, all from the, the police scanner. And then I, little by little, found uh, public databases that were accessible on the internet of, of historical movements that I could program in. And then I learned when I was about 17 or 18 that this whole thing that I was doing had a name, and it was called Dispatch. So I found the biggest dis dispatch firm in the world, which just <coughs> happened to be in New York City. And it was called DMS, and I found, um, I found their website, but they had no contact information, no way to get in. So I was pretty good at computers at this time, and St. Louis had a, a pretty strong uh, underground hacking culture. And uh, I learned a lot from it, and I figured out a hole in their website, and uh, I found their corporate email list, and I found the name uh, of the CEO and the, and the email of the CEO and the chairman, and I sent him an email saying, your website has a hole in it, here's how you fix it, and by the way, I write dispatch software. And uh, they flew me out, and I, I joined DMS. Um, and suddenly I was working on dispatch for all of New York City, uh, which was amazing, because the, the thing about dispatch for me is you could actually see how the city is working, living, breathing, how it moves. Um, but unfortunately, in that case, it was from a very vertical uh, standpoint in terms of city services. And, uh, and Twitter really was born out of a desire to see it from a personal level. If, uh, if an individual could report what they're doing and where they're going and uh, what they're doing next, um, and we could see that all in real time, what would that look like? Uh, and um, so, yeah, in my my, uh, most of my fascination and career really started in, in dispatch was just high transactional, always available, um, low latency systems that were deep, 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 deep in the, in the background in many places that people just didn't consider or see. And with regards to Twitter, when you set it up um, alongside you know, the other co-founders, did you have any idea? Where did you want it to go? Where do you think it might go? Or were you hoping it would end up? We, uh, I mean, we didn't really have any, um, any idea. <laughs> and, and that's not why we were building it. We were building it because uh, we wanted to, it was, it was fun. And, uh, and it was something that we, we wanted to see. And I had my dispatch background, and uh, Ev had a blogging background, and Biz uh, joined up at Blogger for a little while when he was at Google. And uh, we all somehow ended up at Odeo. Um, Ev joined Odeo and became CEO. Uh, I joined about two months after that, and then Biz joined two months after that. And the funny thing about that was no one there really cared about what we were building, which was podcasting. Um, and we, we just had no passion for it. Uh, and the, the business was not doing well. The direction was, was fairly weak. So we, we often went out and just thought about you know, what, what would we do and what would we want to work on? And we had these, these hack days where we would actually try to implement some of these ideas. Um, and, uh, and, and Twitter was born out, of, born out of one of those. But the important thing about that is we just had this amazing team, but the wrong initial idea. And when you have amazing people and really creative people, um, you'll come up with something. And, and, and really the desire was just to to build something that we wanted to use on a, on a daily basis. And it resonated with us every day. And, uh, and we were fortunate in that it resonated with others too. But there was no particular design or desire or goal around um, its success. And I, I think it's very hard to, to start with that as a, as a barrier because it, it, it ends up blocking uh, the creativity, ultimately. Um. From my understanding, you went to college for a little bit and then dropped out, obviously, to pursue your other goals. Did your time at college have any impact on the way, where you are today, or was it just something that got in the way of your real passion? I think uh, everyone learns in a different way, and um, I, was, um, I was deciding 
because of this fascination with city, it's cities, I also had a fascination with, uh, with leaders of cities and, and mayors. And I was deciding actually when I was entering in university, should I go with a political science program or should I go with a computer science program? I know most people don't compare the two, but um, I did. And uh, I decided ultimately to go down the computer science route because I imagine that if I went down political science and I went down the route of, of trying to be a mayor and to get into politics, that I could write a law or a rule uh, and I could probably see the effects of it within two to four to maybe eight years. Whereas I could write rules and laws um, in a program and model it and see it within, see the result of it within eight seconds. So the, the speed was quite attractive and, uh, and just this unbounded uh, creativity and potential that's in front of you when you, when you program, it's, it's a weird feeling because um, you, you have this ability to just create something from absolutely nothing. And uh, whatever you imagine, you, you, can, you can probably do. Um, and there's a, real, uh, there's a real electricity to that. So in school, I found that it was more driven towards um, an academic uh, outcome than it was a practical outcome in my particular program. So I was learning a lot more. I was at DMS when I was at NYU. I was learning a lot more and moving faster than outside of the university than I was inside. So I just decided that I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to end uh, the university part and just work on uh, on the external and get working on, um, on on what I want to build right away. And uh, I, you know, my my mom reminds me every week that I I still have an opportunity to go back to school. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'm, I'm learning a lot right now. And uh, I think it, it's a different answer for every single, every single person. And you have to answer it only for yourself. On that kind of point, was it a really tough decision? So you mentioned your mom um, not necessarily, I don't know, she, she still wants you to go back to university. Um, was there a lot of pressure from your parents when taking that decision? Or did you just go ahead and, with their support? I more or less just went ahead and did it, but um, they, uh, they were not happy about it. I mean, I come from a, a Catholic upbringing in St. Louis, Missouri, so um, my parents um, didn't finish high school. And I was the first to even attempt going to college. Um, parents uh, weren't all that well off, uh, so, you know, they, they definitely had a lot of aspirations for me in that particular vein. Uh, so there was, you know, there was a lot of... Uh, standard Catholic guilt that <laughs> went along with that decision, but um, I got over it, and uh, I don't know if my parents have. Yeah. Um, and you talked a little bit about politics as well. Um, I read somewhere that your dream job was to be mayor of New York City. Well, aspirationally it was, but I've realized that I feel like I can probably influence more with, um, with these companies than I, than I could actually being a mayor. And I think that's generally um, been more and more the case. These groups of individuals who are creating uh, these technologies and creating these movements and um, have just so much influence right now. And it's not limited to any particular geographic or political boundary. And it's really, it's really, really exciting. And that, and that comes with a, a, um, a responsibility that forces you to mature very, very quickly. And again, it goes back to like, where are you learning the fastest? And I just felt my, my maturity and going down one particular uh, route of life was, uh, was so much more accelerated than, than another one. Um, and I think um, going down the political route and, and more of a, a mayor route, which I still love, uh, I, I, I just don't think I'd be able to do as much as I'd like. And I, I, I love my I love my freedoms and my, my independence, so that would also be cut off. So yes, yeah, coming back to the companies, you're involved with both with Twitter still, as well as your CEO of Square. How do you balance that? Is there ever a conflict of interest, or just in terms of time, you, how do you decide where the priorities are? Well, I, um, I spent a year where I actually did half and half, and the intention was just to keep that to a year and kept it to a year. And that was really hard. Uh, I started the week at Square and on Monday and uh, 
I would go to Twitter in the afternoon, and then I would start Tuesday at Twitter, and then I would go to Square in that afternoon. So I'd have this like snake uh, through that felt like these, you know, 24-hour days at one company. Um, so I made it. I made it work, but it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't the healthiest thing. Um, and now we we just have such an amazing uh, leadership team in place, and uh, and the potential is is really in front of the company. So. I concentrate my time a lot more now on uh, with our CEO uh, Dick. Uh, so we have dinner every every Tuesday night, same restaurant, same table, usually the same food, um, never the same conversation, which is always a good thing. And then What's the, food? Uh, the food is good. What is the food? Uh, it's a, a restaurant called Zuni. Yeah, I probably should not have given that name out, but <laughs> I did. Um, probably gonna have to find a new place now. Um, Sorry. No, that's my fault. Um, so, uh, I, uh, yeah, and then I, I just meet with uh, um, uh, members of the management team um, on, on Tuesday. So, I think there's actually a lot of parallels between the two companies. Um, I think they're both working on something fundamental, something essential to a civilization and to humanity. Uh, Twitter, obviously, working on communication, and, and Square, working on commerce. Um, both uh, have been with us forever. Uh, we, commerce, uh, I believe, actually uh, was, was a predecessor. We were trading goods and services before we were using language to trade stories. And uh, what's, what's interesting to me about both is um, if, you, if you simplify either one of them, uh, there's so much that's built on top of each that actually benefit and get easier for people and get better for people. So I'd rather spend all of my time and my effort focused on the, the lowest layer of, uh, of what we have to deal with on a daily basis. And uh, I, I can't think of, of anything more fundamental than, than communication and commerce, apart from health and education uh, and obviously governance. So I think all of those are, are on the same level. And I would always, I would always choose to um, work in some dimension in, in simplifying those. Um, and, so I see a lot of parallels between the two companies in that sense, and in, in that they're fundamental. And I also see uh, that they both, um, they both stand for a uh, very clear purpose. Um, and they both stand for a leveling of the playing field. Uh, what was most amazing about Twitter was that we, we designed it for, for SMS, so anyone in the world that had access to you know, just a a shared or a five dollar cell phone could actually have a conversation with the entire world and uh, you know someone um, with a with a five dollar Nokia could actually have a conversation with someone with a nine hundred dollar iPad and we see that almost every single day and it really makes the world feel small and we have we have some of the uh, you know these really powerful individuals using the service and then we have um, we have the largest governments in the world using the service. So, you know, they're both, the, the important thing is they're both using the same tool. And that means, um, you know, you're only limited by the, by the quality and the influence of, of your idea and, uh, and your ambition, ultimately. Um, and it can scale back and forth quite quickly. And we see the same thing with Square, where we have, we have people who are piano teachers or golf instructors or doing something on the side using the exact same tool that we supply to, to Starbucks and Uniqlo and, and to Whole Foods. And if we can handle the transactional capacity of a Starbucks, that means that anyone who has that aspiration in the same way that Howard did um, could also use us to get there. Uh, and, and that means that because it's the same tool, it truly levels, levels the playing field. And my, mother, um, my mother owned a coffee store when I was, uh, when I was 12 and, you know, she had a very, very different ambition than, than Howard Schultz. Uh, her ambition was to provide a venue for the neighborhood, to provide a sense of community in the neighborhood, to sell beans, uh, but to only have three employees, and those three employees happened to be me and my two younger brothers. Um, and she didn't want to have multiple locations. She didn't want to grow beyond that. And I find that to be very admirable. And I think there's, a, there's generally a trend today where more and more companies and more and more groups of people can actually choose to stay small and still have 
massive impact, whether it's a deep impact like my mother in a community or a global impact, um, like teams of six who can actually create something and, and really uh, everyone around the world can, can participate in it and use it. Howard Schultz had a very different ambition, which is he had a similar coffee store and he wanted that coffee store in every city around the world. And uh, I admire both approaches, um, but it, it's a difference in, in ambition and, and what they want to do. And I, I believe that fundamentally the tools should remain con consistent and, uh, and really get out of the way so that people can, can meet that ambition. Okay. Um, just to kind of continue on that, so you talked a little bit about how Twitter is a, is a great leveler. And indeed, you can make an argument that there have been amazing things happening on Twitter and Twitter being used for things like the Arab Spring, the uprising, coordinating the protests. And then more recently, there's been a lot of focus on Twitter trolls and some, some of the negative abuse that can happen on Twitter. Do you see the company as having a social responsibility to promote a certain view or promote certain ideals? Or is it very much, as you said, just a tool to allow people to interact? I mean, I think the main purpose of Twitter is to make sure that we let every voice flow. And I think it's really important for us to see every opinion. And I think ultimately, like, every technology is just a reflection of, of the world and what we want in civilization, um, both the present and the future state. So um, what we, we have to make sure of, though, is that everyone who participates uh, in lending their voice to Twitter and, and using Twitter to amplify that voice, they feel safe doing so. And, um, you know, abuse has, has, no, has no part uh, on, on the service. And we have a, a staff of many that are dedicated to making sure that people feel safe and they can continue to trust this, the brand um, and, and the service to make sure that their voice is, is heard everywhere in the way they want it to be heard and also that uh, they don't feel threatened uh, in any way, but you know, I, I, I want to, I want to live in the, I want to live in a world where I can actually see all opinions, um, because I think, um, I, I think there's there's value in every opinion. It's up to me to decide which one uh, is truly valuable and which ones or which ones I, I act on. But if we were to take that away and and, and live in very very sheltered. Uh, ways, I think we would, uh, we would take away a, a massive uh, learning opportunity as well. So I think the most important thing is to give people controls. You turn it off, you turn it on. Uh, and um, I, I think uh, as long as those, in, those controls are intuitive and people know how to use them immediately, uh, people, people feel great and trust, uh, and trust the service. And, and when that fails or when it's confusing or when people are frustrated, we've failed as a company as well. Okay, my final question on Twitter before we move on to Square. So then, based on that, do you have a problem with things like ISIL using Twitter to promote the latest, their video? Do you see that as being something that maybe Twitter should draw a line on and you know, close the site, close that particular account down? Or do you feel that it would get a lot of retweets? Is it something that people deserve to hear about? I, I think it goes, again, back to the controls. I, I think. Um I think people should have the freedom to choose what they, what they see and what they choose not to. Um, I don't think it should be forced upon them. I don't think it should be, uh, you know, an un unexpected surprise in any way. Um, I think they fully have to, to opt into it. But the more we start adding bias or editorial uh, to the service, uh, the less uh, people all over the world trust it. Um, and I think that, that trust is something that we've really worked hard to earn and, uh, and we will continue to do more of that and be very transparent around those policies. I mean, I, I think the most important thing is, is to explain why um, something like that may still be on the service. Um, and, and to also work with our peers to make sure that we have a consistent point of view uh, around that. But this is a reflection of the world today, and this is happening. And I, I would rather live in a world where at least we're having a conversation about it and we and we're talking about it because I think ultimately it allows us to move faster in, in solving it and fixing it and addressing it um, if, if, if that's what we need to do. Okay. Now, moving on, you left Twitter, at, or I mean, you, you left as CEO, and most people would have said that, you know, creating and founding one life changing business is enough, but you moved on to set up Square, which has just been launched in the UK yesterday, was it? Launched around the world yesterday. Around so the we, world we yesterday. Launch, uh, we launched a 
our cash register products around the world for free uh, yesterday. So those, of peop those people in the audience who might not necessarily know a huge amount about Square, do you want to very briefly explain what it is that you do? What's your vision for the business? Yeah, so five, how many of you have, uh, have seen Square? Good amount. Um, we have a lot of work to do. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do with Twitter, too. So I mean, that, that's one of the reasons why you, you, keep, you keep working at this, is uh, if, if it feels over, um, it just, I don't think it's, it's truly as, as big as it, as it could be. So I think, um, so five years ago, uh, I, uh, I switched roles with my co-founder, Ev. And uh, he was chairman, and I was CEO. And I became chairman, he became CEO. <laughs> And uh, I reconnected with uh, my second boss after my mother at the coffee store, which is a guy named Jim McKelvey in St. Louis, Missouri. And he became a, a glass artist. And uh, we, uh, we really loved working together when I was about 15, 16 years old. And um, he was an engineer as well. And uh, we were talking about you know, just wanting to work together again. And we didn't really know on what. And then one day he called me in desperation and said, I lost, a, I, lost, I lost a sale of my glass art. And he sells you know, $2,000 pieces of glass art. Uh, and the reason he lost that sale is because he couldn't accept a credit card. And the funny thing was we were both talking to each other on an iPhone. So we have these like, effectively supercomputers next to our ears. And the guy can't close a sale because he can't accept a credit card. So why, why is that? And, uh, and we started asking why, and we started realizing, wow, this industry is extremely complicated. Um, so it seemed like a very interesting challenge. Can we build something that allows Jim to accept a credit card? And uh, we, we set aside a month to build it. And uh, we knew nothing about the credit card industry. Both of us were actually in credit card debt at the time. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we saw what the credit card industry actually did to St. Louis and families in St. Louis. We didn't really like the credit card industry in many ways. We didn't think it was fair. Um, but we recognized that buyers were using them all the time in, 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 uh, in the United States. And all these independent sellers and, and the smaller folks really just had no opportunity to even accept them. So what it meant is they, they ultimately missed a sale and they, they missed an opportunity to grow or, or opportunity for revenue. And um, so we, uh, we searched on Google for how to accept credit cards. We found rockbottommerchantaccounts.com. We signed up for rockbottommerchantaccounts.com. And we started uh, learning about, well, how do we actually accept the credit card? Do we take a picture with the phone? No, that seems like a weird experience if I'm handing over my credit card and you're taking a picture of it. Uh, we looked at the, the 30 pin on the bottom of the iPhone. and. Turns out that has a huge license fee, and we just didn't want to pay that. And, uh, and then the interesting thing was uh, all these phones have a headphone jack on it, and the headphone jack is also a microphone. And if you, probably uh, not for a lot of your cards, but if you take out your credit card and you look on the, the back, there's a magnetic strip. And that mag magnetic strip is actually the same technology that uh, you would use as in a cassette tape to play music. And in fact, that is an audio track. And that audio track can be decoded into numbers. And those numbers are your credit card number and your expiration. Um, and if you actually play this uh, audio track, it sounds like a, a squirrel screeching. Like, I don't, I don't know if you've heard a squirrel screaming, but it's not a, it's not a pleasant sound at all. Um, but if you, if you swipe it through, you actually hear that sound, and you can write some software to decode that into a number, and then you can send that number up to uh, Visa and MasterCard. You can check to see if there's funds available on it. And if there are, you capture them. And then that goes into a bank account. So we ultimately made uh, a cassette tape reader that plugged into the microphone jack of the iPhone. And we swiped the cards through. And the, and the damn thing worked. Um, and, uh, and we swiped, uh, this was my favorite company to pitch ever because I would go around to people and I would say, do you want to see my new, my new project? And they would say, yeah. And I would say, well, hand, give me your credit card. <laughs> and, uh, and they would say, no. Uh, I said, well, you're not going to see what I'm working on. And um, 
and then they would hand it over and I would take anywhere from five to five hundred dollars. Um, <laughs> I would take five hundred dollars for the, from the people who gave me like black Amexes and whatnot. So, um, and, uh, and the way we, uh, we pitched it to, uh, to VCs when we actually decided to build a company and, and raise money was um, to see the pitch, they would have to uh, give me their credit card as well. And um, we, we did something interesting. I put all the VCs that I didn't want to work with in the first week, and I met 10 during the first week, and all the VCs that I really wanted to work with in the second week. And, uh, and the, the reason why is I wanted to make all my mistakes in the first week and then just nail it in the second week. And the last, uh, the last VC that we met is the one I wanted to work with most, which, which was Vinod Kosla of Kosla Ventures. And uh, the price started very high with $100, and it went down to $1 with Vinod. Um, but uh, it, was, um, it was just uh, it was a lot of fun. We, we learned so much about the credit card industry and risk and fraud, and we knew nothing about building hardware, and we, we learned everything that we needed to to make it work in a month. And it just started resonating with, with everyone we, we showed. And, uh, and little by little, we figured out how to actually build the readers and send them out for free. And, um, and then uh, a funny thing happened in that we realized, hey, we weren't just building a credit card terminal, but actually we were building a, a full point of sale. And these points of sales around the world, I mean, it's a, there's a reason that the, the acronym is POS. Um, they are not the best systems in the world. Uh, and uh, people don't ha hold you know, very high regard for, uh, for a point of sale. It's usually a, effectively a calculator on, on top of a cash box. But what's, what's interesting in the, in the opportunity is that there's all this potential um, data and insights that you can have around a business that you can actually bring back up to the seller to help them make better decisions around how to grow their business. And some people decide, I don't want to grow my business. I'm happy, like my mom, with what I have. But a lot of people uh, do want to grow the business. And they have just no access to any analytics around how they're doing. Uh, most places um, that, we, that we found in America, like coffee places, you go in and you ask them a very simple question. How many cappuccinos did you sell today? And they'll have no idea. And if they do know, they're usually counting cups coming out of the dishwasher or waiting for uh, you know, their paper cup inventory to diminish. And it just seems so simple to solve, but uh, no one's spent the time to do it. So we ultimately um, have been working on, for the past five years, a really sophisticated register uh, that is um, in many ways on par or better with what a Walmart has in terms of running and understanding their business. And we give it away for free uh, to all these sellers. And that's what we, we launched yesterday and made available to the whole world. So anyone around the world can download this piece of software for their Android or their, or their iPhone and, uh, and really see and understand their business and, and you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully grow that business from it. Because we just believe so much in the power of the independent business and the small business to, to drive the, the global economy. Okay. Um, do you see this being particularly focused? You talked a lot about, for example, coffee shops in America, but off the top of my head, I can just think of, for example, in India, we, uh, it's a place where there, are, there aren't that many huge supermarket chains and loads of small businesses, and nowadays there are so many smartphones out there. Do you see this as being particularly helpful in places like the developing world, or is it, is it not really something that, you know... Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's less about, we're, we're definitely seen as a, as a mobile payments company. And mobile payments is one of those phrases that just means kind of everything, and, and therefore it means nothing. And, uh, and I, I think ultimately what it's about is, is around commerce, which is a very, very simple activity. It's an exchange between a buyer and a seller. And it has nothing to do with the payment device that's used to do that. It could be a barter, it could be a digital currency, it could be uh, a credit card, it could be, it could be a paper currency. Um, but what's important is really accounting for that transaction, that, that exchange of value, because if you can account for it, you can learn from it and then you can grow. So I think that applies in, in every, every market, not just, uh, uh, not just a market like the United States or, or, or in Europe, but, but everywhere, because I think everyone um, can make use of, of insights and, uh, and, and this data, and if they have access to it in an easy way where they can just flip it on and wow, like I, you know, why am I getting all these sales at 3.40 p.m. and what if I open, 
you know, an hour, uh, what if I stay open an hour later for the next two weeks? What does that actually do to my, to my business? It turns out it increases my business by 20%. We've had, we've had sellers, you know, look at that and, uh, and, and, and actually perform those actions. So now our job is to answer that question and, and direct them in that way before they even ask the question, right? And, and that's, uh, that's really exciting. And, and then we can also build um, pretty interesting uh, services. Um, like we, we, have, uh, we've, we launched a service called Square Capital six months ago. And what it does is we have this deep, because we're building the register, our merchants, these companies, are putting their full inventory, their full menu, a list of all their employees, their full business, all of their sales into this one system. So we have this really deep understanding of how they're doing, right? We know their industry. We know, we know a lot about where that industry is going. Um, so what we can do is, uh, after, uh, after a few, uh, few months of them just using the register, which is free to download and free to use, we can actually send them an email saying, you know, uh, here are three options. Um, we're, we're happy to announce that, you know, we, we can extend you, advance you capital. And uh, from these three options, it could be $1,000, it could be $5,000, it could be $10,000. Uh, would you like to, you know, get this advance of capital? Here's the price. It's all fair. It's all upfront. You know exactly what you're paying for the capital. And you can choose one of those, and it goes into your bank account the very next business morning. And typically, you have to go to a bank and get a small business loan, and that process is six months to even a year in some cases. And the way that this advance is paid, is, is paid uh, and returned is actually just by swiping their customer's card, uh, a fee is extracted. So just in the course of doing the, their business, um, they're actually paying that advance back. Um, and, uh, and we've, le and we've uh, advanced over $75 million in just six months to 15,000 sellers, and 85% of, of sellers who have taken advance once take another one. So there's an opportunity not just to build something that accepts a payment, not just to build something that allows you to see your business, but actually can give uh, businesses capital to grow their business in a very fair and upfront and uh, you know, a very rich, uh, rich way. Okay. My final question before we open it up to the audience. How do you see Square working with things like Apple Pay, the introduction of NFC chips and phones, or is it a competitor? And, and things like, even like Bitcoin, I guess. Yeah. I think um, our philosophy has always been, you know, we're, we're building this register, right? And we need to empower our sellers to accept every form of payment that comes across the counter. And whether that's cash, check, uh, EMV, um, NFC, Bitcoin, any other digital currency that comes their way, our sellers should never have to think about that. They should always think about making, only think about making the sale. And buyers should just have the, the freedom to use whatever they want to use. So if they want to use Bitcoin, they should be able to use Bitcoin. And they should not, the seller should not have to think about what currency or what payment method they're, they're using. So um, we, uh, we started in the U.S. We, we opened uh, in Canada and Japan. Uh, and NFC has just never been large in those, in those markets. And I know that that seems uh, counter to what you all experience because NFC is, is growing quite quickly in the rest of the world. But I always found the U.S. is really behind and technology adoption, mass technology adoption. Like, even with Twitter, it took us 10 years to um, really adopt SMS in mass. You all had it for 10 years prior to, uh, to the United States, and, and we didn't really get it until uh, 2005, 2006. And the reason why is it was the first time when you could send a message between the two largest carriers, a text message between the two largest carriers, which were Verizon and Singular because they both had different uh, technologies. Uh, SMS, as you know, is a, a G GSM technology, and Verizon is a C CDMA. So um, we, uh, we never really invested in building an NFC reader because we were in markets that had no uh, buyer adoption whatsoever of NFC. Um, so Apple could change that. But what they've done is they've created a convenience, which uh, is a chip that proxies a physical card and allows it to be uh, read by an NFC terminal. So we, we certainly don't see it as, 
as competition in any way because we're not building a phone and we're not building a payment, payment device. Uh, we're building a register that accepts payments. And, and what that means is we need to build an NFC terminal that, that accepts it. And back to that philosophy of, of making sure that our sellers can accept every form of payment, it's something we have to do. We have a, we have a product called Square Market that allows uh, anyone who's using the register to flip a switch on any of the items in the register. And it builds a web page for them that they can tweet out or put on Facebook or put it on their own, uh, their, their web page. And, and people can actually, buyers can actually use Bitcoin to pay with that. So if, uh, if they've turned on uh, the e-commerce the e side for any of those items, Bitcoin is an option for a buyer. And we get a small amount of uh, orders from that. But it was important for us to make sure that we're, we're constantly testing, uh, testing these new technologies. And, and you know, our sellers are, are paying us to, to do that work and to be ahead of it. Brilliant. So that's it from me. I'm now going to move on to some questions from the audience. Hi. Um, why 140 characters? It's a great question. So there's two reasons, one practical and one conceptual. Um, so the practical one first is that we, uh, we originally focused on SMS. And, and the web was really just a way to kind of archive and, and see the tweets uh, later on. Uh, the web was really not a big part of the original vision because we wanted something that was, that was real time and live and you could actually feel and, and it would buzz your pocket, right? You could actually physically feel it. Um, so the other thing that was really important to us in, in working with SMS was um, making sure that we had a very simple approach and simple experience and that simplicity meant in that case that we would send one message, um, that a message would not break up uh, and there was a, a limitation in SMS at the time, uh, which was 160 characters. So I had a really, really cheap little Nokia device, and I love the thing. It was from a, a Virgin, and it was a prepaid phone. And uh, I wanted to make sure that it worked on this thing, and I had a great experience on it. And you know, that was a, a T9 keyboard, and uh, a lot of you probably haven't used the T9 keyboards, but. Um, <laughs> I used them and I loved them. It was super fast. And uh, so uh, we, we took those 160 characters. Um, and you know, I also paid for every text message. Um, so we didn't want to, we didn't want to break it up and, and, and require you know, to receive a text message to get charged twice for one, for one tweet. Um, this was important to me, but it was also important to, uh, if we wanted to go around the world, we could actually uh, reach everyone in a, in a cost-effective way as well. So the 160 characters, um, we took 20 characters out for the username, and we arrived at 140, and that was it. Um, but the conceptual side of it was we believed that, uh, you know, this uh, constraint inspires a creativity. And if we really constrain the size of the canvas, people might be more off the cuff, and they might be more in the moment. And uh, that's really what we wanted because we wanted this to feel, again, very live and, and just very, uh, very human and, and very of the moment. And, and the metaphor you know, we use is like if I were to give you a, a red paintbrush and this huge canvas that, that just took up this entire wall and I asked you to go paint that canvas, you compose yourself naturally, right? Because this is a huge canvas and, and you want to you, you want to you wanna do the right thing. You know, that, that's what kind of goes through your mind. But if I were to give you that same paintbrush and that same red paint and I give you a business card and I say, make a mark, just very quick to, to make the mark. And, and that's kind of the feeling we wanted was that everything you, everything you write, everything you tweet is of value to someone. And we want to make sure that it feels like you can just fire these things off very, very quickly as if you were you're speaking, and, uh, and, and someone, the interpreter, uh, is, is going to, to value it. And, and that's always been really important to us. And you know, in, the, in the early days of the service, we, um, we, got a lot of, uh, we got a lot of heat for the 140 characters and, and just how useless uh, Twitter was, right? And, and people would, would explain in a way that, well, this is just a since it's only, only 140 characters, you know, 
all, all people are going to end up doing is just talk about what they have for breakfast. And we would hear that so much. Like, the, Twitter is just about what you have for breakfast. And, you know, my answer to that is, well, you know, sometimes I do tweet about what I have for breakfast. And most of the world could care less and is probably offended because it's so uh, not valuable to them. Uh, but there's one person in the world that really cares, and that's my mom. And when she gets the tweet that I just ate breakfast and what I ate for breakfast, then she's really happy because she knows that I'm still eating, I'm alive, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and I had breakfast, and she loves it. So what, I mean, what's interesting about that is it's all up to who receives the message and who interprets the message, and we can't, we can't judge the value um, as it goes out. We, you know, we have to leave it up to the individual to really bring value to that message and to that tweet, uh, and that's always been a, an important part of our, our philosophy. Thanks. Uh, what are some of the key lessons from your time at Twitter which helped and influenced the way uh, you set up uh, and launched Square? Uh, there were many. Um, I, uh, you know, again, I, I really had no aspiration to be a CEO or to be a leader in a company or even create a company. I just wanted, I wanted to, to build and use this thing. And uh, I was so excited about that. And, and, and really, you just learn whatever you have to, you learn whatever you have to learn to make that work. And, and right now, a company is just a great vehicle to spread an idea around the world. And, uh, and it allows an idea to, uh, to thrive. But the idea and the purpose of our work always leads, not, not the company. The company is, is support and the, and the business is, is oxygen uh, to that idea. So um, I think, uh, you, when, when you are tasked with then creating a company, you, you kind of want to, you, you, you tend to, or at least I did, you grow up a little bit too fast sometimes and you try to put too much structure in place or uh, the wrong structure in place. Um, and that distracts you from, you know, really the work that you absolutely need to do. Uh, and one of the interesting thing, I, I, two big lessons from, from that time. Number one was the, the power of instrumentation, the power of knowing exactly what's happening within the system, and the power of transparency uh, within the system, but also within the company. So <clears throat> we would go down a lot in the early days of the company because we just had no instrumentation at all. It's like driving a car, flying a plane, and not having any sense of how fast you're going, right? Uh, it's extremely dangerous. So we, uh, we just didn't know what people were doing with it, how, how the resources were being used, uh, and, uh, and ultimately, it just crashed to a halt multiple times. And uh, little by little, we started instrumenting the system. And uh, we, uh, we built simple things that would tell us what the system is doing or how people are using it. And these seem like, of course, you, d you build dashboards, and of course, you, you, know, you look at the data. But you know, in, the, in the moment when you're creating these things, that's not what you put first. It's, it's often a, an afterthought. Uh, and w the biggest thing that that solved was we stopped speculating about what was going on and we could actually point to what was going on. And then, since we could point to it, we could fix it. Um, and we had a ton of uh, communication issues in the company at that time. Uh, just uh, the, 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 we, we wouldn't talk to each other <laughs> for in, in some cases. And, and in like uh, engineering, sometimes we wouldn't talk to operations. And when you have those divisions in the, in the company, uh, the people using the service actually see the results of it, right? So any organizational difficulty actually manifests in the service itself. Um, and, and that's just ultimately rude and selfish. And you're putting your own, uh, your own mess in front of uh, the people that are using your service or, or the customer. Um, so as we started instrumenting the system, uh, we had a lot healthier communication. This is a funny thing, because we're building a communication company, and we couldn't communicate internally. Um, so that was number one. And the first bit of code I wrote for Square was an admin dashboard, so we could actually see everything that's happening constantly. And then number two is just how important it is to, um, to really make sure that you're building the right team dynamic. And, and that means hiring great people who share your, you know, sh who share the purpose uh, and share the vision. But it also means that 
we're parting ways with people who, who don't. And, uh, and we had some people in the early days of Twitter who were just, you know, not, uh, not, not, not folks who really worked well together with others. And, and uh, this was probably the, the hardest thing for me to do as a, a CEO in the early days is I had, to, I had to fire someone who had the entire system in their head. Um, and when you're faced with that, you're like, well, I can't, I can't fire this person because if I fire this person, then the whole system is going down and we can never get it back up. Um, and uh, it took me a long time to do it, it was about six months, and that's uh, you know, a, a regret, actually. Um, but ultimately, when I, when I did it, and I did it, and you know, when, I, when, I was, <laughs> when, I was, when we were parting ways, I was crying and he was crying, and then I went back to tell the company, and we were only about seven people, and I was crying, and the company was crying, and like, <laughs> it was at a very emotional period, because we were also under a lot of stress, because we were constantly going down, and now we just parted ways with a guy who knew how to bring the system back up. But something really interesting happened immediately after that. All these new leaders in the company emerged, and actually we didn't go down. And, uh, and we, built, we built a lot of great practices to stay up more and more. So I think um, when you're just getting started, whether it's a company or organization, you try to get people really quickly, but you, you, don't, you don't edit as much and you don't really make sure that there's a great team dynamic. And if you don't, it can be really, really um, poisonous to the culture and, and ultimately will, will block new ideas and new leadership from, from emerging. So constantly looking at, at the team and making sure that we have the right team in place is something I uh, apply to Square as well. Hi, my name is Christiana. I want to thank you for coming to Oxford today. Um, my question to you is, what do you think more people in your position within the tech industry can do to encourage women in tech? So in your case, you've invested in Peak and you've also um, set up a female coding program at Square. What do you think others in your position can do to follow suit? Well, I mean, I think, I think doing it. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it's just um, women in tech, but really establish, establishing more leadership uh, in, in, our, in our women. And um, I'm really proud to say that like over 54% over of Square is led by, by women on my team. So our CFO, uh, our head of business, and our head of engineering are all women leaders. And uh, they, uh, you know, I, I think the most important thing is to always establish uh, a role model for who you're, who you're really looking to become in terms of your own leadership aspirations and, and your own uh, aspirations around impact. So making sure that we're, we're really um, hiring for that and, uh, and, and we're hiring really great people to put them in, in those positions of leadership and we're, um, and we're establishing that in the company as a, as a majority of the company, not a minority of the company, um, is really critical. And, and, then, and then talking about it all the time. This is, this is what we've done uh, and, uh, and we're really proud of it and we're, we're doing more and this is what that looks like. And, We've invested a lot of time and effort and resources into programs like Girls Who Code, uh, who um, does an intensive uh, uh, seven-week program uh, uh, teaching girls how to, how to engineer and program. And we have our own program called uh, Code Camp, uh, which we do uh, three to four-day intensives uh, for um, uh, college girls and also uh, high school women as well. So, um, I, I think it's you know just uh, just doing it and, and making the time and investing in it and, and setting the intent and, and you know making sure the whole company knows that this is our intent and this is something that we believe in. It'll just spread because everyone in the company will constantly talk about it as well, and that'll spread around around the industry. So we try to talk about it uh, in in as many ways and channels as we can. Um, with Square, you seem to have got lots of funding on board, um, and it seems sort of from the face of it that you're very much in charge still. Uh, in my experience, that's quite hard, small startup, uh, but big funds on board. How do you go about um, attracting funding and then managing your investors after you've secured it? I think the, um, the, the thing that's always worked for me is realizing that uh, your, your investors are... Um, First and foremost, I always want to go to anyone that I, I want to work with uh, with something to show. 
And it was really important to us before we talked to any investors on the Twitter side that we actually had people using the service in, 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 in some, at some scale. And on the Square side that we actually had a working prototype. And Square we had really seven merchants when we actually went to raise money. Uh, but we had a working prototype that people were actually using. And uh, if people can't see it and feel it, it's very, very hard to, to sell. And I, I don't want to just go and tell people this is going to be the biggest thing ever. I want to, I want to be able to show that and uh, have them feel it and walk away feeling that as well. So, so that's first and foremost is uh, have something to show um, and so that they can actually feel it and start making it a part of their story uh, as well and feel like they have ownership over it. And then second is the realization, like, I always kind of uh, approach this as like, this is a, this is a, if, if we take money from someone, this is kind of like hiring someone that we can never fire. We can never get rid of, right? So that means, do we really want to work with this person? Is this person going to be someone that really pushes us, pushes us in the way that we need to be pushed? And, uh, and you can tell that very, fairly quickly in that first week of pitching Square, got a lot of people who um, said, you know, okay, great, we don't have any questions, we'll get back to you in about 30 minutes, probably with a, with a term sheet. And I said, I don't want a term sheet, um, especially if you're not asking any questions, because they ask no questions during, during the pitch. And that means if, if they're on our board, that they're actually not going to be uh, all that constructive in terms of really asking the tough questions and making sure that we're uh, you know, we're not just in our own bubble, but they're looking outside. That is the role of the board, is to, is to look outside and, and bring all their insight and wisdom to us so that we can help guide the, guide the company. And, uh, and that second week, we got a lot of tough questions, and, and that's what I love, because I know if I'm getting tough questions in the pitch, I'm going to get tough questions in the boardroom as well, and not just the boardroom, but every week. I mean, Vinod emails me once a week about, have you thought about this? Are you doing this? And you know, um, I know this person. Can I make an introduction here? And uh, it's just very, very useful. So I'm looking for someone who I, I just love working with. And uh, I think you you have to set a very, very high bar. It's not just about money or the firm. It's about the individual that you're ultimately going to work with. And uh, people ask me all the time, like, you know, what firms would would you suggest I go pitch? I'm like. Find, find the people that you really want to work with in those firms, and if there's someone that, that really, you know, just really resonates with you and, and, you love, and you love the idea of working with them, focus on them, and um, if, it, if it tests out to be, to be the case, great. But uh, I think um, you, you have to kind of treat it as like, I'm adding this person to my team. And Square was, um, was a little bit different because one of the things that I stated to all the investors in the board meeting and, and, and folks who might join the board is like, look, this is not going to be a stress-free company. Like, there is so much interest in, in commerce and payments, and there's going to be a ton of competition in the future. We're, we're very early right now, but there's going to be a ton of competition in the future. And uh, uh, not a lot of people uh, want to work in payments because it's perceived as being slow and you have to work with these banking partners which aren't the fastest moving organizations in the world and people are trying to steal money from you all the time. So um, this is not a place that you know it's going to be stress-free so I need to know that you will actually have a, a level head in times of in times of crisis because it's going to be very easy for us to see something and then react quickly and if we constantly react to something then we're actually building someone else's roadmap and we're not fulfilling our own vision. And I want to make sure that we stay calm, cool, collected uh, in that, as a board and as an investor group and that you trust the folks with the most context to do the work and, and that is the folks in the company. Um, and I just made sure that everyone, everyone knew that and if they didn't like that, then don't invest. And, uh, and some, people, some people walked because of that and that was great, great for me uh, because uh, that meant I didn't have to deal with that later on. <laughs> Um, you know, I think social uh, networking platforms have had the, the dual effect of uh, attracting hundreds of millions of people, but also um, alienating many. Um, those who've used it and also those like me who, who never joined them. Um, not because I never wanted to sort of enjoy the benefits that they offered, but because 
of my sort of um, uh, fears over privacy and you know my fundamental skepticism uh, of sort of where technology is headed. So, what do you say to that? And how do you try to coax those people, the, the unconverted, um, the the fearful, uh, but the ones who are equally as enthusiastic as you to to join sort of the global community, whether online or, or, or personally. I, um, yeah. Thank you. I think, it's a, I think it's a great question, and it's, it's definitely a concern shared by, by many. I think the f first and foremost, we, we, we say the word technology, and we tend to put it on a pedestal. And that pedestal makes it very abstract, and then that abstraction makes it very scary. And we have to keep in mind that technology is, is ultimately just a tool. And these are tools. And we pick up the tools, and we give power to the tools. And, uh, and we can also take that power away from the tools. Um, fundamentally, I believe that all tools and all technologies are, are really just reflections and, and mirrors of, of our desires as a civilization, our desires as, as a humanity. And, and ultimately, I think a, a reminder and potentially even a crutch uh, that we're already born with everything that we need. And I, I, truly, I truly believe that, you know, and, and you see this trend where we're moving from these abstractions where, you know, before a computer would fill this room and, and now it, it fits in my pocket and maybe very soon around my wrist. And uh, just 10 years ago, the only way to, to input something was a keyboard and a mouse. And now we're using our fingers and potentially very, very soon we'll be using our voice and, 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 and more of these these very human aspects. So the interfaces keep becoming more and more human and, uh, and, and utilizing more of what we're born with. And um, I think uh, what, what's important to me about, about Twitter is that um, I think it's the closest thing that we have to, right now, that we have to like a global consciousness where you can actually see the world in real time. And, and not only can you see what's happening from from a news level and from an event level, but you can actually see how people think and, and feel about it. And ultimately, if we have more of that sort of activity, and, and the nice thing about Twitter is you share as much as you want, or you can just stop. Um, if we have more of that activity, though, we actually see how people live and what they desire and uh, you know, how, they want to, um, how they want to see the world, how they want to change the world, uh, how they want to live in the world. And ultimately, I, I believe that that creates a potential for empathy. And if we have more empathy in the world, we have more opportunity to remove a lot of, a, a lot of conflict. So I think broadly, um, we can use these tools in a way to build more empathy around the world. And that empathy can actually, actually has a chance to, uh, to diminish a, a lot of the conflict that we see and you know, we're, we've also internalized. But I, I believe that we have the tools necessary to do it without these technologies as well. And I think these technologies really serve a purpose of reminding us of that. And you know, maybe in 20 years, 50 years, we will understand how to lock more of the powers of, of the mind in order to, in order to do that. We're, we're busy exploring space, and we're busy exploring the, the physical universe. But, um, but what really interests me is are the folks that are really exploring the, the depths of, the, of consciousness and how the consciousness actually interconnects and how it relates. And I think um, technology provides a model for that, that that might teach us in a different way. So I think it's something to be excited about. But it, it again goes back to these controls of how do I turn it off and how do I turn it, turn it on. And if that's not intuitive uh, or if it's not apparent, then it's going to feel scary. And if we continue to use these words like technology or disruption, or if we don't explain the, the why of what we're doing with these things, these, these are things to increase the amount of people who can participate. And these are things that increase velocity of communication or effort. And if you increase velocity and you increase participation, you get time back for more meaningful pursuits. Uh, and I, I think that's a net positive. But we can also use the tools in a very negative way. And we just, we have to make that decision. It's ours and ours alone. It's not the tools.
Greatest inspiration? Um, I, that, that, varies, that varies a lot. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think you always find uh, role models for phases of your life. And right now, I'm, I'm, I'm really obsessed with this artist named Robert Irwin. How many, have, how many of you know Robert Irwin? Um, <laughs> okay, well, I, he has a, he has an, there's a book out about him, which is an interview of his life, and he's an artist, and uh, he, uh, he started as a, as a painter, and then he started questioning, well, do I really need the boundaries of the canvas? And then he moved to, to light, and then, you know, he made these, these light sculptures upon walls, and he's like, well, do I really need the, the wall? And then he started using, you know, just these massive rooms, and he's just constantly questioned every single thing. And I love people who, who really uh, are comfortable exploring this, this, this ultimate question of why, right? So, you know, why is a question that is just, it's the easiest question to ask, but it's the hardest question to answer, right? And um, that to me is, is really, you know, the, the driving force and, and, and what, uh, how curiosity manifests is being able to constantly ask the question why and doing the work to answer the question why. And this is a, this is a you know, sometimes a, a fun little exercise is you take a, your friend or your parents or, um, or uh, your nephew or nieces or brothers or sisters and I would do this to my parents all the time, like, Dad, why is the sky blue? He's like, well, you know, such and such and such. And like, well, why? Like, well, you know, um, because of this and why? And uh, he's like, that's just how God made it. And it's just, it's, it's interesting how quickly people kind of go to authority. And then there's another route where instead of going to authority, it's like, well, that's, that's what we proved with science, or you know that that is a, that's how the universe works, um, or that's what you know uh, this person said, or that's what you know my boss said, or whatever it is. Uh, there's another course where we can say I don't know, and if you're saying I don't know, then that means that you're going to find out. And uh, and Robert Irwin is someone who just constantly questions every single thing that he does in terms of this. Uh, this why, what, like, why am I painting in a canvas? Why is that? I don't know. And, and then he explores a completely different meaning. So he's, a, he's definitely a current role, mo role model, but I've, I've, had, I've had many, many throughout my, throughout my life. Virginia Woolf is another one to whom I love. Um, and uh, uh, in terms of just her, her prose and her writing style and, and just her strength and confidence and comfort with uh, being isolated in, in her work and her art. Um, and uh, you know just how uh, how she lived as well. Thanks very much for coming today, Jack. Um, really enjoyed your talk. Uh, my question relates primarily to the branding of Twitter, and you touched briefly on 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 some branding issues. Could you talk about a little bit how about how you came up with the name Twitter, and also the verb to tweet? I mean, it's something that everybody knows, regardless of whether they're a Twitter fan or user or not. And to me, it's very iconic. And I think you really nailed it. And I'd really like to know the thought process about how you got there. Yeah, I I would agree with you. I mean, I I think um, I think Twitter is a uh, is one of those brands now that has uh, so much awareness around the world. I think it actually has more awareness or equal awareness to to Coca Cola. But unlike Coca Cola, it actually stands for something. It's not just a beverage. No offense to Coca Cola, but I don't drink it. Uh, but it actually stands for something um, to people because people bring the meaning to it. People bring their own purpose to it. And people bring uh, their own ideas uh, to it. And, and they feel ownership over it as well. Um, so we, uh, when we were starting the company, we wanted something that really kind of expressed or, or had a physical manifestation. You know, because when you received one of these messages, and, and they were called updates at the time, we didn't have the word tweet. Uh, when you received an update, your phone would, 
would buzz. And we, we just thought that was so cool that like, you know, you do something virtually and it actually affects something physically. That was amazing. And it was just so cool for me as a, as a programmer. I could write one line of code and I could actually make uh, Biz's pocket buzz, which is hard to say. <laughs> um, and he's like, whoa, and uh, takes out his phone and it's, it's a message. Uh, and I just thought that was so cool. So we wanted a name that really um, celebrated that. And uh, we came up with the word um, jitter and twitch. And both of those words don't really bring up the best sort of imagery, right? It's <laughs> something you actually want to avoid. Um, so uh, Noah, Noah Glass, uh, who started Odeo and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and was formative in the early, early Twitter days, um, went to the dictionary and he found the word Twitter. And it's actually in the dictionary, and it was in the dictionary before the company. And it means a short, inconsequential burst of information and chirps from birds. And we saw that definition and we're like, of course, I mean, this is it. This is what we do. Uh, so we took that name and then like a, a standard Web 2.0 company, we removed the vowels um, and we started with the name TWTTR. But we didn't do it just to copy like a Flickr or the, you know, the, the Web 2.0 trends. We did it because we were text-based. And in the United States, a short code uh, was, was five digits. And we wanted, the, we wanted our short code to be TWTTR. So we applied for it. And then we found out that uh, this magazine, Teen People, had that short code. So then we added the vowels back in. And we came up with the short code 40404, which had nothing to do with what we did, but it was available. Um, so. Uh, so then our name was, uh, our name was Twitter. And um, because it was chirps from birds, um, we, uh, we, we took a bird illustration that we found on the web. And that became our logo. Um, and, uh, and then the people using the service actually came up with the word tweet. And uh, you know, we, we, a lot of our history is really around people using the service, uh, inventing ways of doing things on the service, the at username, the hashtag, the retweet. I think one of the, one of the new uh, kind of models and, and interesting behaviors is this, this concept of the, the tweet storm, which is you know number one, number two, number three, number th four, number five, number six, this uh, series of tweets that's meant to be one. Uh, all these things have been invented by the people using the service. And the word tweet was coined by the people using the service. So. Um, it's, it's really meaningful when you build a brand so that people can bring their own personality and their, their own uh, invention and, and product to because that means you haven't just built a, a product, you've actually built a platform. And, and people can build upon that platform and, and make their own thing upon that platform. And then if they feel ownership over that, uh, they continue to just use it in, in really interesting ways. So we've been very, very fortunate in, in the name and uh, and the, the bird as our logo, and, and the current bird just, you know, when you see it, it really stands for something. It doesn't just stand for something for the people in the company, but stands for something for, the, for people in the world. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's something I'm, I'm really, really proud of. But it, naming is so difficult and something that I, I, uh, I've always had trouble with because my name, uh, people always thought my name was actually John. They thought Jack was a, a nickname. And uh, no, I said, you know, my, my name's actually Jack, believe me. And uh, my name actually has 14 different definitions in the, in the dictionary, Jack, and uh, 13 of them are derogatory. So I always had, I always had issues with my name and, and naming in general. And, uh, uh, but but uh, having the right name just just really uh, makes, makes everything really magical. So. Okay. Brilliant. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Thank you all for coming. And I would like you all to join me in thanking Mr. Dorsey for coming on this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.